What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're gonna to be talking about respiratory alkalosis. Before we get started though, down in the description box, we'll have links to comprehensive notes and illustrations that you can utilize to enhance your learning experience and follow along through the process of this lecture. If you guys love this lecture, you benefit from it, it helps you, please to continue to support us by hitting that like button, commenting down in the comment section, and most importantly, subscribing. All right, Ninja Nerds, let's get right into it. All right, so when we talk about respiratory alkalosis, what is this? Well, we know that if we were to get an ABG on a patient, right? We had a patient who we got an ABG and came back into the computer system and you got alerted. Okay, I got to take a look at this ABG, see what's going on with this patient. I look here at the ABG and I see, okay, pH is 7.48. Mm, what's a normal pH? 7.35 to 7.45. That is greater than 7.45. So that's abnormal and it's on the alkaline end. So there's alkalemia in this case. So I'm gonna put an up arrow here to indicate that there is a high pH or there's alkalemia, okay? Next thing, I go down to my CO2. My CO2 is 28. Normal is gonna be anywhere from 35 to 45. That's way less than 35. So we're gonna draw a down arrow in this case. So down arrow. That means that there is low CO2 within the blood or hypocapnia, hypo hypocarbia. Um, in this case, the next one is you move on to the bicarb. Bicarb is usually supposed to be within what? 22 to 26 is generally gonna be the nice sweet range. We're a little lower on that. Let's write down, it is lower, but let's try to figure out what the overall issue is here. And we will in just a second. And the next thing is we look at the PO2, okay? This is basically the concentration or the partial pressure of oxygen within the blood more specifically. So the partial pressure of oxygen within the blood. And in this case, it is 45 millimeters mercury. That's really low. Normally, we want 80 to 100, okay? That's normal amount of oxygen, uh, partial pressure. If it's between 60 and 80, it's kind of a mild hypoxia. If it's between 40 to 60, that's gonna be more of a moderate hypoxia. And if it's less than 40, that's a severe hypoxia. And hypoxia is just low oxygen amount within the blood that's being delivered to the tissues. So in this case, this is low. And so there is definitely some pretty decent hypoxia in this case, more along the edges of moderate hypoxia. So if we have this ABG, we know that there is alkalemia, right? There's an upgoing pH in this situation. Now, if you guys remember, how do we remember what the primary cause is? If CO2 is going in the opposite direction of the pH, it's a respiratory disorder. If bicarb is going in the same direction as the pH, it is a metabolic disorder. We obviously know that this video is respiratory alkalosis, so we know the primary problem is respiratory. And we can confirm that by saying, oh, the CO2 is going in the opposite direction of the pH. So this is a respiratory alkalosis. But remember, we said that the bicarb is lower, okay? Well, what happens is you're probably starting trying to compensate, right? Whenever you have an alkalosis, the pH is high. If I get rid of some of that bicarb and I kind of retain some more of those protons, my pH should start going down. So there's some compensation and that's why the bicarb is a little bit lower in this case. So in this scenario, we know that this person has what's called respiratory alkalosis. We can define that based upon the pH and the CO2 going in the opposite direction. We also know that there is some metabolic compensation. But the question is, was there full compensation or partial compensation? Partial compensation means that it didn't go back to a normal pH range. Full compensation means it did go back to the normal pH range. It didn't go back to the normal pH range, so it's a partial compensation. And the last situation here, is we know that this person also has some pretty bad hypoxia. So there's some moderate hypoxia because they fall within that around the 40 to 60 uh, millimeter of mercury range. So this is a pretty bad case. I'd be a little nervous if I saw this ABG, okay? So what do I have to do? Well, the next thing I have to do is I gotta figure out why is this person having a respiratory alkalosis? And so we gotta go through our pathophysiology, our causes. But before we really, really do that, we have to have a basic understanding of the physiology, starting from the respiratory centers within the medulla and going all the way till we breathe out CO2 or bring in oxygen. So how does that normally work? Inside of our brainstem, you have these medullary respiratory centers, right? Particularly within the medulla, you have these respiratory centers. So here this is gonna be, you'd have a midbrain, pons, medulla, spinal cord, right? Here's our medulla on the lower part of that brainstem. There's respiratory centers there. One is called the VRG, 
and the other one is called the DRG. Whenever someone is getting ready to start initiate the breathing process, to, to having a normal rate of breathing, a normal depth of breathing, these respiratory centers should fire, particularly the VRG will fire. And it'll send signals down the spinal cord to activate these motor neurons in our spinal cord. When these motor neurons are stimulated or activated, they will fire. And the fire action potentials that'll move down this axons of what nerves? Well, nerves that are gonna be going to particular muscles that are involved in breathing. What are those muscles that are involved in breathing? Well, this big sucker right here is going to be your diaphragm. This is a really, really important one. It's one of the primary muscles that are involved in inspiration. The other one are these little muscles here that are, which are located between the ribs. And these are called your intercostals. And there's two types. The external intercostals are the primary ones that are involved in inspiration, whereas the internal are in forced expiration. So these are the two muscles. And we're gonna have these nerves going to stimulate this muscle to contract and these muscles to contract. And when they contract, they cause the diaphragm to go down. They cause the actual ribs to kind of go forward and upward, increasing the space within the thoracic cavity for you to pull air in. And then if you have healthy lungs, you should expire the CO2 out. So in healthy individuals, they should bring oxygen in and then push CO2 out. So that's kind of the normal process of how this breathing should occur. Now in pathophysiological scenarios, like in someone who has respiratory alkalosis, what's the problem? Well, the problem is that they are just breathing off a lot of their CO2, and so their, their CO2 levels within the blood are gonna be lower. Why is that a problem? Think about that. If your CO2 levels, right, for example, your CO2 levels in the blood are lower, what happens? What's that reaction? CO2 plus water yields what's called carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is a weak acid that disassociates into protons and into bicarb. If there's less CO2, because you're breathing a lot of that CO2 off, what does Le Chatelier's principle say? The reaction should shift to the side where there's less amounts of that molecule. In this case, it should shift to the left. If you shift to the left, what happens to the amount of protons which are gonna be present within the blood? The amount of protons, because you're shifting it to this side, should start to decrease. So in this case, there should be less protons that are gonna be present within the blood. If there's less protons, what does that mean for the pH? Remember, it's an inverse or logarithmic relationship. So in that case, the pH should increase. And that's where we get that alkalosis. Now, we understand now that the problem is that they're breathing off a lot of their CO2, less CO2 within the blood. They're having the reaction shift to the left. That means that the protons are decreased and causing the pH to increase. The question is, is what is causing this CO2 loss? Why are they losing too much CO2? So let's think about this. Let's start from the center and then kind of work our way out to the lungs and just figure out causes along the way. So if you think about this, what if I just increase the activity of my medullary respiratory centers? So I just drive up the activity of these respiratory centers, and I'm having these guys fire more frequently, sending more signals down, causing more contraction, and breathing off more CO2, and causing less CO2 within the blood. What could be reasons that I'm hyper-stimulating or really, really agitating that medullary respiratory center? A big one is drugs believe it or not. So drugs are gonna be a very, very strong stimulus. And what type of drugs should we be considering? Well, one of them is going to be particularly things like salicylates. So salicylates are gonna be things like aspirin, right? So if someone is taking too much aspirin, like an overdose of aspirin, what that can do is that these drugs can actually hyper-stimulate the activity of these medullary respiratory centers, cause increased firing, increased contraction of those muscles, and then you're blowing off more CO2, lowering the CO2 within the blood. Other things could be things like methylxanthine. Sometimes there can be uh, drugs like methylxanthine. And another one, so this could be salicylates, methylxanthine, and another one is nicotine. Nicotine is also another one that can also cause a lot of hyperstimulation of that medullary respiratory centers. So these are three particular drugs that we would wanna be thinking about that could be hyperstimulating this medullary respiratory center. The next one 
is infections. You know, uh, particularly like gram negative uh, sepsis, when someone has particular bacterial infections, and you know what type of bacteria are the really, really nasty one? It's when you have the gram negative bacteria. So gram negative bacteria, particularly in what's called sepsis. So if someone has sepsis, secondary to gram negative bacteria, what happens is some of the toxins and the lipopolysaccharides and things like that can actually cause hyperstimulation of those medullary respiratory centers, causing them to fire more often, causing more contraction of your respiratory muscles, causing you to blow off more of that CO2. Should make sense, right? So sepsis would be another reason, particularly gram-negative sepsis. The next one is interesting, very, very interesting. So you know whenever the liver is functioning normally, it can actually metabolize uh, certain substances, and like particularly breaking down um, uh, ammonia and making it into urea. Whenever there's liver failure, so let's say that someone has liver failure, particularly to the point to where that liver failure has become so, so bad where the liver isn't able to deal with that ammonia so much, and it causes some problems with the central nervous system. And because it's causing problems with the central nervous system, the primary thing is called encephalopathy, secondary to a hepatic cause. So hepatic encephalopathy. So what happens is, normally the liver should be able to utilize ammonia, right, and convert this into urea. But if the liver is damaged, it's not able to perform that task. And so instead, this activity doesn't occur. And so you build up a lot of ammonia and ammonium ions. Well, these, when they travel to your central nervous system, are very strong stimulants of that respiratory center within the medulla, causing increased firing, blowing off more of that CO2. So that could be another reason, which would be liver failure, particularly hepatic encephalopathy, where they're not able to clear the ammonia into urea. The next one that you want to be thinking about this one's actually very interesting, but it's, it's more, again, increasing the activity of those neurons. And how it does this is a condition called hyperthyroidism. So when someone who has hyperthyroidism and they're producing a lot of T3 and a lot of T4, right? In this situation, what does this do? These increase the basal metabolic rate of multiple different types of tissues. As you increase the metabolic rate of multiple different types of tissues, what can that do? that can increase the action potentials, the excitability of these cells. And so if you have an increased basal metabolic rate, what that should do is increase the activities of these medullary respiratory centers and cause them to fire more frequently. So that could be another reason. And someone who has what's called hyperthyroidism, particularly a very severe type of it, where there's a crisis or severe, very bad, sometimes we call this, uh, thyrotoxicosis, so more in the very severe forms um, of hyperthyroidism, like thyrotoxicosis, could you see this type of effect? There's one more thing that I actually don't want you guys to forget as well, and that is in pregnancy. Sometimes in, in females, whenever they're pregnant, their body obviously is dealing with a lot of different types of hormones. And one of those hormones that has a very profound effect um, on the, the actual medullary respiratory centers is progesterone. So sometimes in pregnancy, when there is some type of pregnancy here, there can be large amounts of progesterone that's being released. So sometimes very, very large amounts of progesterone in pregnancy can also be a very strong stimulus for those respiratory centers and lead to that increased firing of these nerves and causing you to blow off more of that CO2. So that could be another one to also think about whenever there's high levels of progesterone, secondary to what? Most commonly you wanna think about pregnancy. Okay, so those are some things that are very, very strong respiratory stimulants. What else though? Well, there could be other areas of the brain that are stimulating these respiratory centers. You know, your hypothalamus. Your hypothalamus has some pretty good influence on these uh, medullary respiratory centers. Hypothalamus is a part of your limbic system, right? So whenever there's some type of like pain, um, anxiety, uh, fearful types of responses that your body is being uh, exposed to that can activate that hypothalamus. And that hypothalamus can come down and send signals to those medullary respiratory centers saying, hey, I need you to fire more frequently because what I want you to do is breathe quicker so you can blow off that CO2, bring more oxygen in so you can get a lot of oxygen to those muscles so that you can run away from whatever, whatever that scenario is. So in these situations, I want you guys to also really remember that hypothalamus. It has a very big effect. And so things that can really affect the hypothalamus is kind of anxiety. So if there's a lot of types of anxiety, pain, fear, 
These are limbic types of things that can stimulate the activity of the hypothalamus. If the hypothalamus is very active, it's also going to stimulate that medullary respiratory center and cause increased firing as well. So again, don't forget about that good old hypothalamus. One more thing, just like hyperthyroidism, right? You're increasing the basal metabolic activities, you're causing more firing of these neurons. What if someone has a fever? They're pyrectic, right? They're having pyrexia, so they're having a good fever. You're popping a fever greater than 100.4, 100, so greater than 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit is technically what we consider to be febrile. If someone is having a fever, fevers can also increase your basal metabolic activity. Also, there can be some, again, more stimulation of the hypothalamus as well. But what happens is this increase in basal metabolic rate and this fever situation can cause both double, double simultaneous stimulation of the hypothalamus as well as maybe increasing the activity of those neurons within the medulla. So as you guys can see, what's kind of like the big central area where a lot of these problems are coming? It's at that medullary respiratory center. So a lot of this is CNS issues, where there's hyperstimulation, whether it be due to drugs, gram-negative sep sepsis, hepatic encephalopathy, hyperthyroidism, fever, or some limbic situations like fear, anxiety, pain regulated by the hypothalamus, or even in situations like pregnancy uh, where there's lots of progesterone production, okay? The only other one which is kind of controversial here is that sometimes if people have midbrain tumors, that can also lead to this type of um, hyperventilation response. We're not gonna get too much about it, but just realize that could be another potential cause. So there's one more scenario that I also want us to really think about. It's a very interesting one, and it's actually sometimes we want to actually cause an alkalotic kind of a reaction in people who have what's called high intracranial pressure. So sometimes when someone has, for whatever reason, elevated intracranial pressure, this can sometimes be very, very, very scary. So high ICPs, intracranial pressure, for whatever reason, maybe there's a tumor, maybe there's a bleed, maybe there was an infarction there that caused a lot of cytotoxic edema around it, but regardless, there's high intracranial pressure. And the fear with this is that whenever there's high ICPs, it can cause the brain to herniate out. Right? It can cause compression of the brainstem, you lose function of your respiratory activity, your cardiovascular centers, and then the patient can die. So what we wanna do is, is reduce the ICP. And one of the ways that we reduce ICP is you have to think about the brain, it's, it has a skull, right? And then inside is brain tissue, cerebrospinal fluid, and blood. The only way I can reduce the intracranial pressure is by reducing one of those three things. I can reduce the amount of cerebrospinal fluid by putting in a shunt, I can reduce some of that actual cerebral edema by certain hyperosmolar agents, or I can reduce the amount of blood flow that's going to the brain, and that can also reduce the ICP. So sometimes in people who have high intracranial pressure, what we will do is we will actually hyperventilate them. Uh, kind of temporarily, we don't wanna do this too long, but we'll hyperventilate them and have them blow off more of their CO2. Why this is important is when you hyperventilate a patient, what does it do to the CO2 levels within the blood? It lowers those CO2 levels in the blood. You know what that does to the actual cerebral vasculature in the brain? What it does is it actually causes the cerebral vessels to constrict. So it causes cerebral vasculature vasoconstriction and by doing that you try to reduce the amount of cerebral blood flow if you reduce cerebral blood flow you know what the purpose of that is it's to reduce the ICP but you only do this temporarily you don't want to do it too long because if you reduce the cerebral blood flow for a long time what could you do you could cause a stroke so again the reason why we would do this is that someone is having an icp crisis and we're actually trying to hyperventilate them iatrogenically so that could be one particular reason we call this kind of like iatrogenic hyperventilation and we're actually doing this because we want to blow CO2 off to cause cerebral vasoconstriction and then reduce that ICP. Another thing that can be iatrogenic hyperventilation is that you actually have someone on the ventilator and you're increasing the respiratory rate, right? You have the, the ventilator settings wrong and they're breathing too fast, maybe on the ventilator. This could be one reason high ICPs and you're trying to do this on purpose. The second reason is that they're on the ventilator and when you have them on the ventilator, you're actually having the settings wrong. And so maybe you set their respiratory rate to be high because you want to blow off 
more CO2 and bring in lots of volume. But when you do that, you blow off too much of their CO2. And so their CO2 levels in the blood drop. And then that can cause that respiratory alkalosis. So there can be two ways that we can iatrogenically hyperventilate a person. One is we're doing it to, as an intervention. And the other one is we just didn't set the ventilator settings properly and we're having them breathe too fast, blowing off their CO2. So those are two other reasons there to think about for someone having respiratory alkalosis. The last one that I really, really want you guys to remember because these are the scary ones and more likely what's going on with our patient who has this hypoxia. So far, all we've been talking about is the reasons of why this patient has lower CO2 within the blood. But we didn't mention why this patient is having low oxygen in the blood and that's scary. Let's think about why. Think about the lungs at this point. You know, whenever someone has what's called pulmonary edema, they have lots and lots and lots of fluid that maybe be kind of sitting between the alveoli. So let's say here, I, I kind of expand and draw like a little alveoli here. I'm gonna draw a little alveoli. And then here you have the alveoli and the blood vessel, the pulmonary capillary in this case. If someone has a lot of edema, right, a lot of fluid which is accumulating between this space and that interstitial space, what's that gonna do to the actual movement of CO2? So CO2 won't be able to cross as much, right? And what else? Oxygen won't be able to cross as much. And so because of that, what will happen to the amount of oxygen that's gonna be present within the blood? The oxygen level in the blood will drop. So that's one particular reason. What is this reason here called again? This one where there's lots of fluid could be in situations like pulmonary edema. And you see these a lot whenever you're just giving too much fluids to someone or they have heart failure. The other situation is what if their actual lungs have a lot of fluid inside of them? So I drew another alveoli. Let's say I draw another small little alveoli over here that I kind of expand on. Here's another little guy. And I have, instead of fluid in the interstitial spaces, I have fluid that's actually kind of in the lungs and a little bit inside of the spaces out there. And some, like some patients who have what's called acute respiratory distress syndrome. That could be another reason. And again, this is altering the movement of oxygen into the blood. And so less oxygen is present within the blood. What could be a reason for this? This could be acute respiratory distress syndrome. Another thing is what if I have an infection? I have an infectious process, a lot of pus, a lot of white blood cells, a lot of uh, material in here that is affecting the movement of oxygen across the, uh, this respiratory membrane. What could that be caused by? Pneumonia. So if someone maybe has a pneumonia as well, this could be another potential reason. So a pneumonia may alter that exchange or the movement of oxygen from the alveoli into the blood, okay? And the last one here is what if I have like a clot? So let's say that I take this blood vessel here for the sake of it and I expand it a little bit. So we have one more area here as a potential cause. And I put a little clot in that blood vessel right here. Okay, and here's the alveoli that I want that blood to go to. I want it to go up to this little alveoli pocket here, but I can't. And why? Why can't I get blood to this area? Well, the reason why I can't get blood to this area is because there's an emboli that's blocking the blood flow from getting there. So now blood isn't actually moving into this area. And so now oxygen, even though it's moving over, it's not getting picked up by red blood cells because the red blood cells are stopping proximal to that embolus. And that also is going to be a problem here. So pulmonary embolus could be another potential reason of what? For what? What is the whole purpose of all of this stuff that we just said? Whether it's fluid, whether it's an infection, or whether it's actually a clot, all of these things affect the movement of oxygen from the lungs to the blood. And so the overall effect of all of this stuff is hypoxia. Hypoxia is a bad, bad man. Why? Because you know what hypoxia does? Especially when we get it to like less than 60 millimeters of mercury. Remember we said that usually we want it like 80 to 100, but if it's less than 80, it's between 60 to 80 is really where it's kind of mild. If we start getting less than 60, we're getting to the moderate sites of hypoxia. What this does is hypoxia is actually a relatively strong respiratory stimulant on these little receptors. You know there's little chemoreceptors that are located near your carotids. You know you have what's called the carotid sinuses and then you have the carotid bodies. Well, the carotid bodies and the aortic bodies, there's also two of them. There's carotid bodies and aortic bodies. They have little chemoreceptors in them and they pick up on low concentrations of oxygen in the blood due to pulmonary embolisms, ARDS, pulmonary edema, or even pneumonia in these situations. What happens is they stimulate these peripheral chemoreceptors. What are these things here called? These are called your peripheral chemoreceptors. And these are located where? Just so that we're clear here. They can be located in the aortic bodies, 
and they can also be located in what's called the carotid bodies. And when these are stimulated by low oxygen, uh, uh, a particular concentration in the blood, guess what this does? This sends messages via particular nerves, the glossopharyngeal nerve and the vagus nerve, comes to your medulla and guess what it says to the medulla? Hey, there's low oxygen in the blood. That means that you're not ventilating properly. I need you to breathe faster and deeper so that you can pull more oxygen in. So what does it do as a result of that? Stimulates your medulla, you fire more, you cause more contraction of the diaphragm and the external intercostals, you breathe more of your CO2 off, but if you haven't resolved the pulmonary edema, you haven't resolved the ARDS, you haven't resolved the pulmonary embolism or the pneumonia, guess what? You're still not gonna be getting oxygen into the blood, so you're gonna stay hypoxic. And that's the problem here. So as a result of this hypoxia, it causes a kind of reflex respiratory alkalosis in this situation because they're blowing off CO2 because the hopes is as they breathe faster and deeper, blowing off CO2, they'll bring in oxygen. But if you don't fix the issue, it's not gonna change. This would be our pretty much our pathophysiology, our causes, truly understanding what respiratory alkalosis can be due to. How do we diagnose all of these? Again, we can utilize our ABG and then use our entire pathophysiological approach that we just took here trying to figure out what the problem is. Now that we've done that, what do we gotta do? I gotta treat this person. I gotta figure out what do I have to do for them. So how do I treat this person? Let's think about this. First things first, let's go to what we started with. Central problems. There's something centrally going on. Some of these we can fix, not all of them, but some of them. The first one that I'd like to fix is what about drugs? You know, there's, this is a common exam question that they love to ask. Whenever there's a salicylate overdose, especially aspirin, particularly aspirin, what is the, the antidote that you actually give to reverse this? You can give this an IVPO. Generally, this is kind of that classic question that they'll bring up on your board exams of the particular antidote that you can give them. Methylxanthines and nicotine, not really too worried about that. What if they have sepsis? What if they have gram-negative sepsis? Antibiotics, right? Not too hard to think about that. So if they have gram-negative sepsis, you're gonna treat them with antibiotics as well as stabilize their hemodynamics, obviously. Okay, but if you treat the underlying issue, that should help to resolve some of these problems. Hepatic encephalopathy, what do we do for that one? Hepatic encephalopathy, you know, you can try to reverse that, but you have to decrease the amount of ammonia. So what do we do for that? Usually in someone who has like high levels of ammonia secondary to that hepatic encephalopathy, we can give them drugs called lactulose, um, or we can also give drugs like rifaximin, okay? Uh, the next thing, what if someone has hyperthyroidism? Not too hard to think about. You give them antihyperthyroid medication. So if someone has hyperthyroidism, you're going to do what? You're gonna give them drugs like propylthiouracil or methimazole. Okay, we're just gonna put antithyroid medications. But you guys know, because you're ninja nerds, that this would be things like methimazole, this would be things like propylthiouracil, a lot of other different stuff, right? Iodine uh, solutions particularly that help with ablating those uh, thyroid follicular cells. Nothing that you can really do with pregnancy, that's just a part of the process. Fever, if they have a fever, what can you do with a fever? <laughs> you give them Tylenol, right? So if they're febrile, you can give them Tylenol, that can just treat them empirically, but you have to figure out why are they having a fever? Is this just a central nervous system reaction or is this an infection? I can treat them with Tylenol, I can try to give them things to cool them down, but if it's an infection, I gotta treat the underlying infection. With pain, anxiety, fear, again, sometimes it's just telling the patient, hey, let's calm down, don't get too anxious. Sometimes they have them breathe into a paper bag to help to retain their own CO2. Sometimes you have to give a little bit of an anxiety kind of medication to calm them down if you need to as well. So those are things that you wanna be thinking about. Um, the next thing is what if they're on the ventilator and you're just breathing too much for them? Decrease the rate on the ventilator. Not too hard to think about, right? Don't have them breathe as much of that off. What can I do about this ICP? It's kind of something I have to do temporarily so that they don't herniate. So again, nothing I'm really gonna do there. Now these guys, this is stuff that I can try to fix because this is gonna eventually cause problems because again, they're gonna start breathing really, really fast, really, really heavy to try to blow off CO2 and bring in oxygen, but the muscles are gonna get weak, they're gonna fail, and then they're gonna go into respiratory failure because they can't actually utilize those muscles because they're exhausted. So how do I fix these? Very, very simple. Pulmonary embolism, you get rid of the clot. How do you get rid of a clot with a pulmonary embolus? Well, it depends, right? You can give them things like heparin, Heparin is one option. 
Sometimes they even offer TPA, tissue plasminogen activator, to bust up that clot. And the other one is sometimes they can do what's called an embolectomy, where they actually mechanically go in and remove that embolus. Pretty straightforward, right? ARDS, what do you do for them? You just have to properly ventilate them. So ARDS is more of kind of a disease where you just have to maintain their actual mechanical ventilator, like maintaining their activity on the mechanical ventilator. So sometimes this is just proper uh, ventilation, okay, and allowing those lungs some time to heal as well as figuring out the underlying cause for their ARDS. Pulmonary edema, this is a big one. You see this one a lot, okay? Pulmonary edema is a lot of fluid in that interstitial space. If I give a drug that can pull some of the fluid out of there, that may reduce some of that edema and help me to get some more oxygen across those lungs. So what could that be good for? Absolutely, no, no I'm just kidding. It'd be good for something like diuretics, Lasix, right? Things like that could actually pull some of that fluid out of that interstitial space. So things like loop diuretics could be helpful in this scenario. And then the last thing here is if they have pneumonia, it's pretty straightforward. You give them what? You give them antibiotics, okay? So it's relatively straightforward, relatively simple to help in this scenario. Now there's one other thing that you can do. If you have someone on a ventilator and maybe they just have this increased kind of respiratory drive where they're just, they, they feel like they have to keep breathing because they need this respiratory drive to continue to keep trying to take and breathe over the ventilator. Sometimes what you can do, uh, as the last thing that I wanna write down here, is that sometimes if a person is on the ventilator, and maybe you're not hyperventilating, but maybe you're, they're actually requiring more breathing and they're having to breathe over the vent, they're having to breathe really, really fast, and they're blowing off lots of their CO2. Sometimes what we can do is we can give them drugs to kind of shut down their respiratory center and say, hey, respiratory center, stop firing for a little bit and let the ventilator do the work, let the lungs rest. So sometimes if a patient is breathing over the ventilator, so they're over breathing the ventilator, Maybe it's not you who's actually causing them to have a higher respiratory rate. Maybe they're breathing over the ventilator, over breathing the ventilator. Then maybe what you have to do is give them some medications to decrease their respiratory drive. And what could that be? Opioids and sedatives. Okay, so you can give them things like sedatives, propofol, Versed, or you can give them opioids, analgesics. Okay, things like fentanyl. And that may suppress the respiratory center and cause them to not breathe as hard and as fast. So that would conclude our understanding of respiratory alkalosis. All right, Ninja Nerds, so in this video, we talk about respiratory alkalosis. I hope it made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it and I hope you learned a lot. As always, Ninja Nerds, until next time.